So thank you very much for joining everybody and thank you, Robert, for your uh, uh, kind availability. Um, Robert, Dr. Thibault, uh, studies on how to increase the rigor and feasibility of scientific research. And his work focuses on developing and evaluating solutions to shortcomings in the research ecosystems. He completed his PhD in cognitive neuroscience at McGill University in 2019, and his doctoral work focused on brain imaging, including neurofeedback, placebos, and suggestion. He now works as postdoctoral researcher with TARC, T A R G, at the University of Bristol and Matrix at Stanford University. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Robert, Dr. Thibault, for joining, and we are really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to make the most of pre-registration. And if I understand correctly, um, not everybody's familiar with pre-registration uh, who's listening to this presentation, so I'll give some of the background um, and some of the basic information, um, and hopefully we can dive a little bit deeper into it towards the end of the presentation. Um, here's the presentation plan, just so you know what we're going to do. Uh, we'll start with talking about what is pre-registration. We'll move on to what is the purpose of pre-registration. Then we can do a little exercise where we can open some pre-registrations and look at them to see what they actually look like in practice. And then we'll talk about how we can make the most out of um, using pre-registration. Um, I'll try to make it a little bit interactive. There's a few polls. I might get you to open some web pages just to make it a little more interesting because I know uh, Zoom meetings um, can be easy to, to kind of fade during. Um, and a lot of this material is motivated from this, uh, that I'll present is motivated from a preprint from Hardwick and Wegenmakers, and also from a APA video on pre-registration um, that's presented by Samin Vizier and Wegenmakers again. All right, before we get into that, I guess I had an introduction, but I'll give a bit more about my background. Uh, did a PhD at this place, McGill University, on neurofeedback um, and related topics, which kind of where you watch your brain activity in real time and try to change that brain activity to improve attention, depression, um, various different conditions. Um, and this is one of the things that made me interested in pre registration because um, there are sometimes questionable research practices, and to get to more trustworthy, rigorous, and reproducible research, pre-registration is one of the tools in a larger toolbox that we can use. Uh, then I moved to Bristol, that looks like this, and started doing meta-research, which doesn't lend itself to nice flashy photos like this person watching their own brain activity, but that's okay. I'm moving to metrics soon. Um, and just in the thought of transparency, there's these nice pictures of the universities, but my office actually looks like this, and then looked like that. And now at metrics, given the current environment, it might look something like my living room. Okay, so what's pre-registration? Um, if we read papers on pre-registration, there's various definitions. There's not kind of one agreed upon, very strict definition, but there's various that kind of are quite similar. So I'll present some. So pre-registration is the practice of documenting your research plan at the beginning of your study and sorting that plan in a read-only public repository. That's one definition in a paper or on a web page. Another one in another paper is to define the research question and analysis plan before observing the research outcomes. And another definition here, pre-registration involves archiving study information such as hypotheses, methods, and analysis in a public registry before the data are inspected. Um, now, I wouldn't stress too much about what the exact definition of pre-registration is, and I'll give kind of my simplified definition that I find useful, um, which is just requires two things. So the first thing is that you write what you're planning to do before you do it. Um, so if you're going to run an experiment, you just write what you're going to do for that experiment before you do the experiment. If you're going to do an analysis, you write that analysis plan before doing the analysis, but also before looking at the data. Um, and so you can pre-register your experimental design and then you could later pre-register your analysis. It doesn't all have to be in one package. You just gotta see what you're gonna do before you do it. And then the second thing is you have to document that writing. And you have to do that specific way so that it's permanent, there's a timestamp on it, it's publicly accessible, it's on a third party website, so not your personal website, and it's read only, so it can't be edited. Um, you don't have to worry about these five criteria if you simply upload it to somewhere like OSF registries or clinicaltrials.gov because they meet all of these criteria. 
All right, so question for all of you. Um, what discipline was the first you to use pre-registration? Let's see if I can get these polls working. There we go. So if that poll is properly launched, feel free to start answering. All right, I'll give a few more moments. Okay, if I click end poll, are the results going to share results? Do people have the results on their screen there? Perfect. And so um, we have four people saying psych or 50% saying psychology. Um, we got some economics, clinical trials, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis. Um, it was kind of an unclear question I posed because all of these disciplines have used some form of registration or pre-registration, but it depends on the terminology we use. So um, clinical trials use registration. They don't necessarily use the term pre-registration, and I would argue they're the first to use registration systematically. And they distinguish between prospective registration where you say what you're going to do before enrolling the first participant in your study and retrospective registration, which is after you've already enrolled participants um, posting what your study was and what you analyzed. Um, now, retrospective registration is also important if, I mean, prospective registration is ideal, but if you didn't prospectively register, it's also useful to have information about a study after it's been conducted in a systematic form. Um, in 2000, the year 2000, clinicaltrials.gov um, and other clinical trials registries uh, opened. And then in 2005, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors um, made a policy that says, if you want to publish in our journals, you have to prospectively register your study. And then thousands of journals have signed on to that policy. And then in 2007, uh, the Food and Drug Administration made a policy that um, clinical trials must be prospectively registered. Um, and then also the Declaration of Helsinki has this item in it that says every research study involving human subjects must be registered um, before recruitment of the first participant. And so any study that says they've um, conducted their study in line with the Declaration of Helsinki must have been or should have been pre-registered. Now, if we're using the term pre-registration, then people who answered psychology are correct because the implementation of registration called pre-registration rather than prospective registration was specific to psychology. And this has a different history than uh, clinical trial registration. And it, the content of pre-registrations also differs from the content of prospective registrations in that they often include analyses and hypotheses, whereas in clinical trials, they often don't include their specific analysis or their hypothesis. They just include outcome measures. Um, one of the drivers of pre-registration in psychology came from this paper where uh, Daryl Bem showed that um, extrasensory perception or parapsychology is real, that people have extrasensory perception. Uh, and he published this um, using kind of standard methods in psychology. In response to that paper, uh, E.J. Wagenmakers and colleagues, um, well, they, they made a response to that paper and they showed that basically Daryl Bem had used normal ways of doing psychology research. And so that either A, um, ESP, extrasensory perception is real, or B, there's a major problem in how we're doing research in psychology. And he has this quote at the end that I quite like. It says, it would therefore be mistaken to interpret our assessment of the BEM experiments as an attack on a research of unlikely phenomenon. Instead, our assessment suggests that something is deeply wrong with the way experimental psychologists design their studies and report their statistical results. Uh, and then again, back to the terminology, somebody said economics. Economics also uses registration and they also use something called pre-analysis plans. Um, 
which are, again, just a specific implementation in a way of pre-registering information on your analysis. All right, another question for you here. What percentage of studies in psychology do you think are registered? All right, got a few people left to respond. Okay. So pretty distributed across the possible answers. Um, and if I go to the actual answers, it might be disappointing. Somewhere between one to 5% of publications in the field of psychology are pre-registered. Um, now this study that I'm referencing here was looking at studies between 2014 and 2017. Um, and it was looking at psychology broadly. So any paper uh, on a database, I forget which database, but on a database that was tagged as psychology. So it's not looking at the top journals. Uh, it's just looking at papers, publications across psychology broadly. Now that number hopefully has gone up um, since 2017, but we don't have those data readily available. In social sciences, a very similar study was run and they found that somewhere between zero to 1% of social science articles are pre-registered. And in clinical trials, I don't have the exact number, um, but I know it's not 100%, even though it's mandated by journals and by the FDA. But there's several papers that showed that there are um, many trials that still are not registered. And so why do I bring this up? I think it's important to remember that registration is not common yet. Sometimes we're in a bubble and everybody around us is doing something. And so we think that everybody more broadly is also doing that. But it's important to remember that, you know, the people discussing these issues about pre-registration were a very small portion of researchers. And it's important to get this information to other people and help um, them learn about things like registration. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, what is pre-registration? Now we'll get on to what is the purpose of registration? Um, and if you can just pop your thoughts in the chat box or um, for what you think the purpose of registration is and why researchers use it. There's many different reasons, so there's not one answer that I'm looking for, but just to get you thinking and get some discussion going. Don't be shy. All right, we got one person saying maybe to be more transparent. That's good, that's true. Another person saying to document your thoughts, questions, hypotheses, predictions, analysis plan before you look at the data to avoid hindsight bias. Um, that's important that hindsight bias is an issue. And even I've had experiences myself where I think I had a certain prediction just in life in general, not only in research, but then as time goes by, that prediction and my thoughts on the topic change. And if I didn't have a document, a pre-registration of what I was thinking beforehand, then I would have thought that I was thinking my current thoughts two years ago. And so avoiding hindsight bias is an important thing. So that's even just for yourself. Uh, to get feedback before starting. So yeah, pre-registration is useful for that because it's kind of a public document that you can get feedback from. Um, to make the garden of analytical forking paths smaller. I would say, yeah, you're, you're choosing one of those forking paths ahead of time is what you're doing. And you're not making those choices in the forking paths of your analysis. You're not making them dependent on the data. You're making them ahead of time, which is important. 
and to avoid publication bias. Yeah, so these are all reasons um, to use pre-registration. Um, I listed some here as well. <clears throat> it's one last comment that somebody puts so that when you have to start writing, half your paper is already done. Yes, I find that very useful. <laughs> Great. Um, so I wrote some other reasons here. So in clinical trials, one of the original reasons to have peer, uh, prospective registration was to help recruit participants. Um, another one was to reduce duplication. So people knew what studies were happening and so that other people weren't just gonna repeat those studies. Um, reduce publication bias, identify outcome switching. So if you say you're gonna look at one thing, but then you publish that you actually um, looked at a different outcome. Uh, yeah, so various reasons. Um, and the reasons in clinical trials and the reasons in psychology and social sciences are sometimes a bit different. And the reason I'm really hammering home, having been talking about clinical trials, I'm talking about psychology and social sciences, is that sometimes there's not enough crosstalk between disciplines, I find, and that we're working towards the same things. So we have slightly different infrastructure, different histories, and that we can learn a lot from other disciplines. So what's the purpose of registration in clinical trials? Uh, is RNA on this paper, they give two reasons. One is to establish a publicly accessible and searchable database for disseminating a minimum set of structured information about all ongoing and completed trials. And the second one is to provide access to date stamped protocols details throughout the study life cycle. And so both of these are a little different than we think about registration when we think about pre-registration in psychology and the social sciences. So one thing in clinical trials, they're trying to get a complete database where all clinical trials are registered. We're in psychology, we're nowhere near that yet. Um, and then also they, they have this point of protocol details throughout the study life cycle. And so their trials, their registrations can get updated, but you can clearly see what was updated. In psychology, Hardwick and Wegenmakers um, wrote there's two reasons for using pre-registration. Um, one is to reduce bias by ensuring that research decisions are made independently of study outcomes. And two is to calibrate confidence in research by transparently communicating information about a study's risk of bias. Um, number two here is saying that it's not necessarily making a study better, but it's allowing you to detect whether that study is biased or not. Again, a simplified version of this is just pre-registration makes clear what study decisions were pre-planned. And so regardless of whether we say, whether we think pre-registration actually achieves all the goals that we've been discussing or all the purposes, it at least does this by definition. And with this information, we can do a lot of useful things. And so for one, it can improve research practice, the behaviors of individual researchers, and two, it can provide information to people like me that are doing meta research and want to look at how research is being done and if it's being done well. Um, so here, I'll show a few figures just to show some of the benefits of pre-registration. So this figure, whoop, uh, this figure on the x-axis, we have the year a paper was published. On the y-axis, we have the size of the effect of reported in that paper. Each dot is an article or publication. And one here with the gray band going across the center, this is no effect. The blue dots are articles that report null effects and the positive, um, the plus sign here in circles uh, are papers that show a benefit of a certain treatment. And this is a series of studies, um, large clinical trials funded by a particular um, funder and what we show here is in the year 2000, when registration became available on clinicaltrials.gov, a lot of the articles that followed published null findings. And so that the publication bias was likely present beforehand, but after registration started becoming a norm, then people are starting to publish null findings much more regularly. If we look at a similar graph in uh, the field of psychology, which looked at registered reports, which are a specific implementation of peer registration, which we can talk about more in the discussion if you'd like to. Um, 
And what this graph shows is that standard reports on the left side, which are just not necessarily pre-registered or registered reports, they almost always support their hypothesis. And then if we look at registered reports, we find that you know less than half of papers actually support their hypothesis. And so publication bias is present probably to quite a degree in uh, non-pre-registered work. Another thing we can do when studies are pre-registered is look if they switch their outcomes. And switching an outcome matters because as soon as you switch an outcome and you don't report that you've switched it, you're presenting exploratory work as if it were confirmatory work. And that's an issue. Um, again, we can go into more detail about that in the discussion if you'd like. And so here, this is a meta-analysis we ran of over 6,000 studies, and we found that 33% of um, registered studies we looked at switched their outcome from the registration to the publication. Um, and so if this is done without disclosure, it's an issue. If it's done with disclosure, that's no problem. Um, and finally, in fields like clinical trials, where most trials are registered, you can do things like this, where you look at all the clinical trials and you can see how many of the re results are actually reported. And about 75% of clinical trials actually report the results. So there's still 25% of registered clinical trials that we don't have the results for. And then registration also has several kind of positive externalities or auxiliary benefits, like better study planning, facilitates peer feedback, uh, can it increase the discoverability of studies that are in progress and can protect against pressure from reviewers or industry partners. Um, so if you don't find positive results and the reviewers or your funder is saying, well, we need positive results, you can say, well, look, I wrote this document, it's publicly available. I said, this is how I was gonna do it. I gotta do it that way. All right. So we'll move on to the third part of this presentation, which, um, where we can explore some pre-registrations. So if you have the slides open, you'll be able to easily click on this. If not, uh, that's okay. I can just click on it and we can view it in my browser. So this is a clinical trial registration um, on the EU clinical trials register. And we can scroll through it and see there's protocol information, sponsor information. Um, many things here. It's all tabulated. Um, looks different than a pre-registration in psychology would look like. And I'll just go to one specific part of this where it says endpoints. So these are outcome measures of variables. Uh, and it says the time points of evaluation of this endpoint is going to be day one, day four, day seven, and day 14. Now, if we open the actual study, is here. And we look for day, we find that their presence and absence of virus at day six post inclusion was included. And so what registration does in this case is it lets us see that, you know, they said they're gonna look at day one, four, seven, and 14, but actually they only published on day six. And so this could be because day six had results they liked and day seven and 14 didn't. Um, we can't know that for sure, but we know that there's a risk of bias uh, because of this. Um, if you want to look at a full list of the differences between the registration and the publication, uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine has already done that here, which is really nice. Um, so I have the study, which was on hydroxychloroquine, um, the protocol that we just looked at, what it says, and then the actual publication and all the differences. I won't go through all of these, but uh, it's the information in the slide there. So if you want to go through it later, you're welcome to. Okay. So one problem here is that's nobody's really checking for these discrepancies between a registration and a publication. And so there's a study quite old now, eight years ago, but that asked uh, reviewers whether they ever opened uh, registration when they're reviewing a clinical trial. 
and they found that about a third of reviewers reported that they, they at least opened the registration and looked at it. Um, editors often aren't checking. Some journals are getting better at this, but um, because this isn't systematically checked in peer review, it's left to people like us, the readers of these papers, that sometimes have to check um, the registration and compare it to the protocol to see uh, if there's a risk of bias. Um, and like I showed earlier, 10 to somewhere between 10 to 68% of registered studies have discrepancies in their primary outcome. Um, we can open a pre-registration here just to see how, how it differs from clinical trial registrations. Uh, this was just the most recent one on the OSF registries. Uh, you can see there's big blocks of text. Um, there's a hypothesis, which wasn't in clinical trials. Um, there's more info about data collection, sample size rationale. There's much more information um, in some regards than on the clinical trials registries, but there's not clearly demarcated boxes saying what is their primary outcome? What are they most interested in? Um, and then finally, if we open a clinicaltrials.gov registration, um, again, similar to the EU trials registration, everything's tabulated. They've made some steps which are really nice here. They have the current primary outcome and below they have the original primary outcome. So you can easily see if somebody switched what they're going to do. And also very nice, they have this link where you can see the history of the registration and see what's been changed. And then you can compare this side to side. These are features that would be very nice in uh, psychological or in pre-registrations in psychology or other fields, but haven't been implemented yet. Okay. Um, how to make the most pre-registration. So there are some misconceptions around pre-registration that I think are important to debunk. And some of them are here. So pre-registration, if a study is pre-registered, it does not mean that it is a good quality study. It could be a good quality study. It could be a bad quality study. What pre-registration does is help us assess whether it's good quality. Likewise, if something's not pre-registered, it doesn't mean that it's biased. It doesn't mean that it's not good research. You can have very good research that was never pre-registered. If something is pre-registered, it doesn't mean that it's correctly reported. So in the field of psychology and some social sciences, there's some journals offering pre-registration badges. So there's this red check mark that appears in the top of a paper from some journals saying that this study was registered. Um, now that even that check mark doesn't mean that the registration and the publication match, that the publication correctly reports what was in the registration. It just means there was a registration. And again, pre-registration, doesn't mean that something is reproducible. Uh, a few other things, pre-registration does not necessarily stop fraud. And one counter argument against pre-registration, people argue that um, it stops exploration. So if you want to do an exploratory analysis, you can't do it if your study was pre-registered. You can, it's fine. Pre-registration is a plan, not a prison. And you're welcome to change anything from your pre-registration as long as you disclose it. That's the main issue, um, the transparency around disclosing the changes you've made. Okay, so one more question for you. This one's a little more complicated, so I'll walk you through it. So think of a study that you're either planning to run or that you're already running, could be anything. Um, the first thing is, does the data already exist? The second thing is, so that would be kind of epidemiology or observational research. Um, the second question is, if the data doesn't already exist, do you know enough about the research question to kind of predict the shape of the data so you could approximate the average that would be in the two groups um, and the standard deviations that would be in the groups. And if you have this information, you could simulate data. Um, and so just think about that for a second. Does the data exist? If it doesn't exist, would you be able to kind of make up fake data that would help you create your analysis or simulate data? Um, All right, I think I launched the poll. So whenever you've thought this through, take your time and feel free to answer there. 
All right, we got a few people saying the data exists or could be simulated. Some that are saying it couldn't be. Okay, so most of you said the data either already exists or you could simulate the data. And a few of you um, said that data doesn't exist or couldn't be simulated. Now, the nice thing, if the data exists or can be simulated, you can make your life a lot easier by instead of writing a pre-registration the normal way we think about it, you actually just write your analysis plan. You create the whole analysis with either uh, blinded data, a holdout sample, or simulated data. So for example, if the data already exists, you can ask whoever has the data to give you a blinded version of that data set. So they can either add noise to it, uh, they could shuffle variables, they could um, create a synthetic data set, and then you can use that data, you can write your pre-registration by actually writing the analysis script. And then you can pre-register your analysis script. And this can be super useful because then, for one, somebody earlier said the paper's already half written. If you do a pre-registration, in this case, the analysis is already written. It's not just a text of what you might do, which when other people or your future self try to read the text that explained what you're going to do, it can be quite confusing because it's hard to write a precise and non-ambiguous analysis in just text rather than writing it in code. Um, and then if you can simulate your data, you can do the same thing. So you can make a simulated data set, write your analysis on this, and then pre-register your analysis code. Then a last few things here. So we've mostly talked about what individual researchers can do, but there's also system levels improvements uh, that could be done to pre-registration. So for example, learn societies and regulators could create minimal pre-registration standards, which um, exist in clinical trials. Um, in psychology, the APA has created a standard template, but it's not clear if it gets used very much. Um, journals could include a peer reviewer that checks pre-registrations and compares them to manuscripts. Uh, data management organizations could provide blinded data sets or part of a data set um, to help people, to help researchers create their pre-registration analysis plan with only that data before receiving the full um, unblinded true data set, and a few other things uh, I've listed here. So at that point, I'll just summarize quickly what we've talked about. Um, so first thing is pre-registration or any type of permanent and publicly available research plan. Um, the one core function that pre-registration will always ensure is done is that it distinguishes pre-planned research decisions. Pre-registration exists in multiple forms. Uh, we've talked about clinical trials and psychology here mostly, but there's also differences for observational research, epidemiology, economics, and political science, et cetera. And finally, I find it important to remember that pre-registration is one tool in a larger toolbox. Um, and the way we use and implement pre-registration still has much room for improvement. Um, I'll recommend if you want to learn more about this, this preprint, um, which is quite thorough, and this presentation, which is um, very easy to follow. Uh, I have a list of references that um, I've used in this presentation. And finally, thanks for your attention. Uh, looking forward to discussing a little bit. And if there's, if you need fuel for the discussion, I've got some suggested discussion topics uh, that I can leave here. Thanks.